What science is and how and why it works. Hello, Derek. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. Hello, it's my pleasure to speak to you. Uh, so, Derek, uh, who would you say you are? Uh, are you a scientist or an educator or maybe just a YouTube vlogger? Yeah, I mean, I would say I'm a science communicator. And if people ask me what I do, I usually say I'm a YouTuber or I make YouTube videos. That's kind of how I define myself, I guess. But you do have a scientific degree. Yeah, so I, I did a engineering physics and then I did a PhD in a school of physics at the University of Sydney. But by that time, I was really clear that I wanted to make videos or make films, something like that. And so the PhD was actually about how to make films that teach physics. So it's pretty applicable to what I do now, but at the time, it wasn't obvious that this was going to lead anywhere useful. Do you know what scientists, uh, real science, well, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, uh, like the people who actually do physics on a daily basis uh, or other science, how do they feel about what you do and what uh, other science communicators do? I think a lot of scientists like what science communicators do and they really appreciate that we're able to take their research and share it with a broad audience. You know, I was recently talking to a scientist at the University of Toronto who's making these tiny magnetic robots. And mm -hmm. I can offer a, a really big reach for that research. And some of those people may be interested in collaborating or in studying with him, or they may understand that now there's a whole different you know, avenue of research to pursue. Or maybe they just get a different perspective on you know, what sorts of research are happening like in their country. So there's so many benefits to having science widely disseminated in the public. It hopefully leads to more support for science and science funding, which is obviously really, really important, particularly today. I think there is a chance, there is uh, sometimes possibility of, you know, maybe science communicators get seen as like stealing the credit or, you know, looking so smart when they didn't actually do the work. So I'm sort of conscious of that. And, you know, when I did my black hole videos, it was important to acknowledge, you know, the whole collaboration of hundreds of scientists who actually did the work. And I just got the fun part of, you know, explaining what they found. Um, and that's what I love doing. And so I'm delighted to have this position and hopefully they also appreciate, um, you know, the reach and the impact that these videos can have. Recently, I've been getting sort of embargoed science news. So uh, some of the journals are sending me stories in advance of their publication so that I can maybe prepare a video to launch with the, mm -hmm. the launch of the paper. I did that for this uh, recent grape plasma microwave uh, experiment was I knew that it was coming out and I talked to the scientists um, and you know made a video in a, in a couple of days to put together for the launch of that paper. So um, it's nice when I can be like right on the discoveries and when you know I knew the black hole was coming out. So you know timing everything so that when this thing launches, you know I, I'm there and I've got the the best explanation hopefully. So scientists do respect you as a way of communicating their and promoting their research. Absolutely, yeah. I've had many scientists reach out to me via email to say, hey, you know, we've got this result. Do you want to cover it? Um, mm -hmm. I did this video about how chameleons change color a few years ago. And that was instigated by a scientist reaching out to me and saying, I want you to help share this information. So hopefully people see what I do and that it's scientifically accurate and that, you know, the coverage that they're going to get from me or the explanation that they're going to get from me is the best explanation I hope they would get anywhere you know, on, on in any media, because I know that the TV mm -hmm. and like newspapers and stuff, when they when they sort of try to explain something, they have to keep it really simple. I don't have to keep it that simple because I've aggregated an audience over the globe who has a science interest and uh, more science knowledge than most people, and so I'm able to go deeper. And hopefully, that's the added added benefit I bring to the audience. Is you know. Hopefully they can come to me and get things explained in more depth and with more accuracy and more precision, more detail mm. than anywhere else in the world. That's my hope. Uh, have you ever heard or encountered somebody saying that you're not a real scientist, you're talking about things you don't know, and you that's just like kid that's just for kids, science communication is not wrong, but useless and so on and so on. <laughs> I don't encounter that view very often, and I'm thankful for it. Yeah, I don't, I don't find many people take that approach. 
And what is your audience now that you're aiming at? And did your target audience change over the years of you making videos? For sure. I mean, when I started making Veritasium, I was imagining an audience that didn't know a lot about science, but who was interested in science. So maybe they just didn't have a good science teacher and now they wanted to find out about science. What I learned pretty quickly was that group of people does exist, but it's not a very big group of people. I mean, if you don't know much about science, you probably don't want to watch YouTube videos about science. Um, so I realized very quickly that I was sort of targeting an audience that was very difficult to target and was probably pretty small. So I changed my focus towards higher level science concepts, you know, things more for people like me. So now when I think about who's my audience, I imagine people kind of like myself. And maybe that's just because I have a lack of imagination. And the only person I can imagine is like, well, what do I like? What do I find interesting? What's fascinating to me? That also helps me with the videos because if I'm fascinated and if I find it interesting, it makes, makes it easier for me to be passionate. And I think that passion comes across in the videos. So maybe by default, my videos are kind of made for people like me. But doesn't that kind of limit your communication uh, part of what you do because if you're making videos for people who are already interested in science are you uh, preaching to the choir we would say yeah so so here's the, here's the problem if you make videos for people who aren't interested in science you probably won't reach them because they don't want to be reached you know If you target a group that is like outside of like science interest is not science interested, you're probably not going to reach them because you're going to make your science video and they're not going to click on it. But if you make a video for a science interested audience, now they don't have to be scientists, they don't have to have degrees in science, but they just sort of science interested, okay, science mm -hmm. enthusiasts, okay, that is the good demographic to target because if you make a great video for them, it'll sort of build in that community in that community and then it'll bubble over into adjacent communities. So I think the best uh, reach that you get into non-scientific communities is actually by first targeting the science interested people and then once that goes big it bubbles over and everyone else can sort of get on board. If you try to target specifically that group it just fails in my view. So, so that's why I think this is the best approach to get there. So do you believe that your videos actually make a difference and what difference is that? Yeah, I do think that the videos make a difference because I receive emails from people who say, now I've decided to study engineering or physics or science because I love your videos. Hmm. So in that way, I know that they have some sort of impact. Um, you know, I've met people in person who tell that to me. Um, I also just think there's, it's worth having more science as part of the discussion and sharing more of these scientific ideas Uh, broadly in the community. When I meet people who, uh, you know, just stop me on the street and they, you know, say they like my videos, I usually ask what they do. And I'd say mm, 40 or 50% of the time, they're sort of science students or, you know, engineers or science adjacent sort of fields. And the other 50, 60% of the time, they're in finance or business or, you know, accountancy or, you know, what, They're, they're, they're in the arts, they're, you know, but they're just science interested. So I really like that mix of, okay, so I know that half of these people are kind of focusing on science as a career and half of them are not, but they're still interested and they're still getting something from my videos. So you, it's not that you dream that everyone will be a scientist. No, I think, I, I don't think everyone should be a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I mean, the thing is, I love science, but I don't love doing science. <laughs> So I have the best possible job where every day and every week I can learn something new, I can investigate some sort of scientific thing, and then I can communicate it with people and I can move on. I, I don't want to spend a decade of my life on one problem, which is kind of what you have to do if you're a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love that there are people who are doing that, but that's not my personality, that's not my strengths, and so I much prefer this job that I do. I feel like it much better suits me as a person. And does your love of science and what you know about science influence your daily life? Like, for example, your family, is it scientific? So, I mean, I've got these kids and we're sort of raising them with an interest in science. Uh, 
we have the Lego Saturn V rocket around, which my son loves to play with. He also has a space shuttle, and he's got clothes that feature, you know, space. And he knows Yuri Gagarin is the first person to make it into space. That's one of his favorite nice. things to say, Yuri Gagarin. <laughs> and he's like two. So, you know, we're raising science nerds kind of by default because we are science nerds. So, you know. Uh, yes, it definitely plays a role in my life. You know, my wife uh, is studying her PhD in planetary geology. So, you know, science and space, you know, it sort of pervades all aspects of our lives. Do you sometimes maybe annoy your friends when they are mistaken about something and you start explaining? So, I don't know if they're annoyed, uh, but I definitely see it as my role to promote truth in all aspects of my life. And that includes when it comes to my friends. Hmm. You know, I, I had a friend over at Christmas who was telling me about negative ions and their, their beneficial effects on humans. And so I looked into the scientific research and surprisingly there was a big body of scientific research. Um, so that led to a video about this. And, you know, I didn't want to be negative. I wanted to be curious. And I want everyone to take that approach, which is, let's not immediately shut this down. Let's explore it for like, what are the potentials? What, what do these studies show? What did they investigate? How did they investigate it? And let's really understand that journey to figure out whether some of this is legitimate or whether, you know, on balance, the, the, the evidence doesn't support the claims, which I think is how it, how it came down. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I hope my friends aren't annoyed, but like I always, see it as important to voice a scientific point of view and, and uh, engage with them in that way. Have you ever made mistakes in your videos? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the mistakes range from simple things like, you know, I went to this anechoic chamber and I think I said anechoic is Latin, but it's actually Greek and it's obviously Greek <laughs> because the way it, I mean, it comes via Latin, but anyway, I'm, you know, I was wrong. Um, more recently with the black hole videos, um, you know, I was sent some embargoed footage right at the time of the press conference. And mm -hmm. one of the files was for M87, the black hole picture they announced. And there was another file that was titled like Sagittarius A mm -hmm. and A star. And it, it had this same type of animation as, as the M87, but a different image. And so I said, well, here, I, I've got the image for Sagittarius A star, the, the black hole in the middle of the Milky Way, I have a, a, an image, which must be a sort of a working image that they're just not releasing widely right now, but I have this and I can share this. So I shared it and um, for the whole day, I wasn't sure because no one else was covering this. I wasn't sure, like, is this a real thing? Is this, or is it a simulation? There was no indication, but ultimately someone got in touch late at night to say, hey, that was actually a simulation. So once I realized that, then I had to, uh, you know, make changes to indicate that. Hmm. Uh, out of the, all the vid videos that you've made, which one is your favorite? It's very difficult for me to identify one favorite, but definitely the negative ions video I quite mm -hmm. like because it's got a story, it's got a journey, and uh, it's got scientists, it's got experiments, but it's also got sort of... Um, weird ideas, it's got research, it's got things that people aren't familiar with, um, it's got crystals that, that actually make negative ions. So, I don't know, th there's so many pieces to that, and I like the way the story came together, and I like the shape of the piece. That's one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites is the video called Can You Solve This? The 248 yeah. number game. Yeah. What I love about that video is it's fundamentally about the scientific method. But I don't know that I actually, maybe I do say scientific method at the end, but it's not, it's not in your face, you know? Like, I think typically when people teach the scientific method, they say, hey, you know, we observe things, and then we make hypotheses, and then we test them, and, like, it's like a recipe. And, mm -hmm. like, that's not what science is. Science is not following a recipe. So this is a video where you get a real tangible idea of what science is and what scientific inquiry is and how we get to the truth and how our brains are biased, you know, all of that is packed into this little like three, four minute video. Uh, and that's what I love so much about it is that, you know, I feel like it, it does that better than anything else I could try. And do you have your least favorite videos? Um, you know, probably some of the early ones are annoying to me. Like I look back now at videos like what is a force or, mm -hmm. you know, 
I'm, I'm just curious about how I ever managed to survive that early period when, you know, I was making these videos about things that nobody really cared about. Um, so, yeah, probably some of the early videos I don't like. In your videos, you famously always start with, uh, with a misconception. And people tell you how they feel. And then you kind of correct them. So, what's your philosophy on that? Do you, should you always correct people if you know that they're wrong? Or maybe not, or maybe sometimes it's inappropriate? Hmm, it's a good question. So, I think when I was teaching more basic topics, it was more important to address misconceptions because a lot of people just by their experience with the world have misconceptions about the way it works, like the way a slinky should fall or, you know, just the fundamental ideas of inertia and acceleration. There are basic misconceptions that are deeply ingrained and not clearly articulated by people. So in those cases, I think it's really important to, you know, draw the misconception first and, and sort of that is the prior knowledge that your audience has. So deal with that. Um, there are different types of misconceptions where people know what the scientific idea is. For example, people who think that maybe the world is 6,000 years old or that evolution is false or that climate change isn't happening. So those are a different category of misconceptions. To me, those are, you know, sometimes willful or political or their opinions, you know, but they're not the same nature as misunderstanding inertia. So I'm much more inclined to use this misconception approach to draw people's attention to blind spots in their thinking, places mm -hmm. where they've had experience with the world and maybe have not drawn the correct generalization. I am less inclined to take on people with sort of political or opinion ideas which are just not uh, evidence supported, you know, because in those cases, it's very difficult to move beyond, you know, well, this is the evidence. And then someone says to you, well, I think the scientists, you know, fabricated that evidence. Well, then I don't know what to say next. Like, I, I don't know what's next in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yeah, there may be times when I would not engage in, in a conversation, like a flat earther. Yeah. Like, I, I, don't, I don't anticipate making a video about that because I don't know what to say besides, you know, the, the, it seems to be like the issue, the fundamental issue is about something different than the geometry of the earth. You know, that we're, that's not what we're arguing about, really. I think we're fundamentally arguing about power structures and knowledge and and who are, you know, the, the experts and all that sort of stuff. And that is a, a different conversation than a conversation about the, the Earth's geometry, which I think is pretty settled. What is the hardest part, is, uh, in your opinion, of explaining scientific concepts uh, to people on the street? There are so many challenges. I guess the challenge that I wrestle with most is first, understanding the science, and then second, figuring out how to explain it to someone. Um, you know, One of the big challenges if you're explaining science on YouTube is that everyone comes with a different level of prior knowledge. So a video that is great for, you know, people who know nothing is not a great video for people who know a lot and vice versa. So I'm constantly thinking about like, who is my target audience? How much do they know? How much can I assume? Where do we start? And what's interesting to them? And, and then take them through that process. So, so the whole thing is, is kind of challenging. And what held you up when you were feeling that? Well, why I'm doing this and so on. Yeah. How did you... six months six months in, I thought about quitting, I think very seriously. I was in a bit of a rut. I had some friends though who were teachers who said, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing is useful. I've played your videos in my classroom, my kids like them, they learn from them. And I guess that gave me enough motivation to keep going. I also had a few sort of sporadic successes. So in my third month of making videos, I made this video about the earth and the moon with a basketball and a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And I went on Reddit and I had sort of 500,000 views in two weeks. And I was delighted. Um, so I think little, little wins like that, you know, gave me this burst of enthusiasm to keep going. But it always is that question of like, what is the last video I'll make? You know, sometimes it feels like every video, you know, it's like, well, is that, is that the last one? Am I just never going to do another one? Because, you know, it, 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 it's weird trying to mount this whole effort to, like, get something to the point where you can release it and feel proud of it. When I made this video about the black holes, you know, I went down to the store to buy, like, materials to make it. And I was here at home and I was meant to be looking after the kids, but 
was trying to like paint my black hole and the kid was like trying to touch the paint and I'm, you know, like everything's just going wrong. Um, but somehow you got to find it within yourself to like, you know, mount the energy to build a thing and then share it with the world and hope that the world likes it because of, you know, all that effort you put in, it really feels bad when it doesn't go anywhere, you know, when it doesn't feel like you're having an impact. Um, so that's, that's the challenge. And first of all, I hope you will, your last video won't come soon because please continue. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I, I do want to keep going and I have a whiteboard over here uh, that I, I'm glad you can't see, but Aww. it's got maybe 15 topics on it. So, you know, I've got a lot of ideas. Can we see it? Uh, I don't want to show it to you because okay. I don't want you to know the idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's there. You you can trust me. Okay. Uh, you've made recently a movie, Twisting Dragon's Tale, and uh, what was the most challenging thing about making that movie? Um, well, making Uranium, Twisting the Dragon's Tale, was just exhausting. We traveled to ten countries, so we filmed over forty or forty-five days. Uh, and we were traveling for about 30 days. So, you know, we, I would work 12-hour days. Um, we were in Chernobyl filming, which was weird. But also, at night, the accommodations where we were staying were very, very cold. So I would actually sleep in all of my clothes and with my uh, jacket on, with the hood up, under my blanket, just to, like, try to stay warm enough. And I was sick. And so, you know... It was just like every day I felt like there were new degrees of difficulty. You know, like in diving, they, they rate the degrees of difficulty of a dive. Mm -hmm. And every day I would be like, oh, here's a new degree of difficulty. It's raining. It's four degrees Celsius. I have to deliver two paragraphs of lines. And uh, I'm standing on a pile of rocks that are slippery. And it's just like, okay, that's like a 3.5 on my degree of difficulty. So like every day there are new challenges. Okay, they, like this person doesn't really want to be interviewed. Or I have to interview them in French. Or, <laughs> you know, uh, we have two hours in Einstein's apartment and then they're going to kick us out. Um, so the, like just always challenges, challenges, challenges. And maybe something most shocking that you experienced while making the movie? I mean, seeing something, talking to someone, just like, what left the deepest emotional impact? While making Uranium, the deepest emotional impact might have been, you know, in Chernobyl, going down to see the radioactive clothes that the firefighters were wearing. And this is 30 years on, and they're still incredibly radioactive. Uh, probably the most radioactive place that I went for the documentary. And, you know, we agreed as a group that we were only going to spend uh, one minute down, you know, filming in this area. I think we agreed one minute, maybe it was five minutes, but we, we agreed on a very limited time frame yeah. to be down there. But it really did hit home this sort of, um, it gave us a real sense of what it must have been like, you know, uh, 30 years ago. It, it's just nuts. And are you optimistic about our future as a uh, humankind, considering that we can do something like Chernobyl? You know, I am optimistic about the future. I think it's just because I'm an optimistic person. So I don't know whether this is realistic, but to me, it feels like the better angels of our natures win out. You know, positivity wins out and people do want to do the right thing deep down. Like, I think most people by default are good. That's my belief about, you know, most people in the world. I might be wrong, but that's, that's, I can't, I can't shake that belief. And so I think we're going to come out of this fine. You know, I, I have complete faith in, in humanity as a species. I put the probability of us annihilating ourselves very, 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 very small. I think obviously the biological field is ripe for technological advances. These things that are happening in uh, genetic modifications and CRISPR, you know, they're going to have huge impacts, I think, in 10, 20, 30 years. I can foresee that that's going to be immense. Um, so hopefully that leads to people living uh, happier and longer lives. I hope my life is, is longer and, and happier and healthier than, you know, most humans have had the, the ability to, to have. Um, so, I, yeah, I really see advances in, in sort of medical technology 
uh, biological technology, genetic work uh, being one of the big things going forward. Uh, is there anything that should change maybe in uh, our perception of science uh, to make that bright future with long lives and autonomous cars closer? Yeah. One of the things I wish I could do is help people understand the work of scientists and how much effort goes into each tiny piece. I had someone email me yesterday and say that they thought maybe climate change wasn't human caused and maybe it was because the sun was getting bigger. And I know it's just this idea, but my, I just wish that people had a sense of scale the number of scientists who are currently studying the output of the sun, mm -hmm. who are looking at satellites that we've placed around the sun, in fact, two of them in stereo so we can get a 3D image of the sun, like how carefully we've been plotting the solar irradiance over the years and the fact that it does go in cycles, but that we have a clear sense of like what it is. So um, I, I just wish they knew about the dedication and the passion and the focus of these scientists to get a sense of scale. And then you can't just write something like, maybe the sun is getting bigger. Did you think of that? It's like, it just doesn't, like, they're on different levels, different sort of worlds of, of understanding and thinking about how we learn about the truth. Um, so yeah, I hope more people get a sense of you know the benefits of science. One study that I came across some years ago was about the socioeconomic standing of a particular country and their perception of science. And the finding was an inverse relationship. So the lower the socioeconomic standing of a country, like you know countries in Africa, uh, the higher their perception of science. And the more advanced an economy, the more science had really provided for that economy, the lower their perception of science. So it's this weird counter, uh, counterintuitive thing but of course, I, I mean, maybe you can understand it. If you have science and technology everywhere, you take it for granted. But if you don't, you really want it. And so that's why we get sort of this, this uh, strange relationship. Um, but I think that's unfortunate because it's sort of like the curse of vaccines, which is like yeah. when everyone's vaccinated and you no longer see the diseases, you're no longer afraid of the diseases, so you don't vaccinate anymore. And like that is the thing. It's the thing about science. When you have science everywhere, when you take advantage of, of all of its benefits, you can start to sort of, you know, deny that like, oh, well, if I don't like this part of science, I'll just like maybe that part of science is wrong. Like, you know, it's like you can't accept the benefits without also accepting what it tells us about our potential challenges. Um, so I wish more people were on board with that. And should we... <laughs> using your terminology, revolutionize education for that, and how can we do it? Right. A revolution in education is a very difficult thing. And there have been so many technologies brought into education and claimed to revolutionize education, but that's never actually happened. And so for me, as sort of a scientist, as an observer, I have to ask the question, why? has this not revolutionized education yet? I mean, if these technologies were so great, why has the motion picture not revolutionized education? Edison thought it would get rid of textbooks. Why not radio? Why not TV? Why not computers? Why not smartphones? Like, everyone's claiming that these things are revolutionizing education, but fundamentally, the classroom's the same. So you can look at this situation and you can say, it's like the teachers, or it's the system, it's the bureaucracy, or, you can suspect that maybe the reason nothing has really revolutionized education is because the limiting factor is the human brain and the way the human brain works. The way the human brain works is that it likes to interact with other people. Like, I like talking to you, and it'd be very difficult to have this conversation with a bot or something. So all these visions of, oh, in the future, you know, all the teachers will be bots, is like, that goes against what we know about fundamental human nature. I need to know that there's someone else there that I'm connecting with. Someone else there who cares about me as a person, about my feelings, about my interests, about my dreams. That's the person I need. And that is a teacher. So how do we revolutionize education? I don't know that we do. 
we just find a way to make teachers understand that their role is not a information delivery device. Their role is as a human talking to other humans and building this social interaction and this connectedness, a community where people value knowledge and find ways to encourage each other and spur each other on to uh, learn more and more things that they're interested in and so that they can be passionate, engaged individuals. That to me is like the greatest vision I have for education. Uh, when you go out on the streets uh, talking to people, isn't that kind of a model of what you wish all the schools would be like? Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely wish that more schools were more interactive and the teachers had more time for each individual student. Frankly, where I went to school in West Vancouver, um, Canada, I had a great experience at school. I felt like all of my teachers were absolutely excellent, you know, subject matter experts, but also very engaging in the classroom and very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so my experience of school was only positive. I know a lot of people have a very different experience and that really makes me sad. And I wish we could, we could improve the quality of schools globally. That requires investment. That requires valuing our teachers. And that's what I want to see happen. I mean, I think that's where you get the real revolution in education is in, in places like the Nordic countries where they highly value and they pay teachers very well. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Uh, do you actively do something? Do you talk to, I don't know, senators, government, or something like that to improve it? I have not taken this on as a mission. You know, this is, I, there are many objectives in my life that, You know, I, I want to make great videos, I want to make great documentaries, and I want to raise good children and, you know, participate effectively in society. But I've not taken on as a mission trying to improve the existing education system. What I do is speak to teacher groups. Mm -hmm. um, when I get asked to go out and speak to associations of science teachers, I'm always delighted to take those opportunities and hopefully inspire those teachers to do more in their classrooms and give them some ideas. And as I say, just support them in any way I can because I think they're doing the most important and, and challenging jobs. Um, so hopefully that's helpful, but I haven't, I, I don't even know where to start in terms of trying to lobby government because it's such a big bureaucratic beast. Uh, what would you say is your ultimate pur purpose and what do you want to achieve and leave as your legacy? Big questions. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the fundamental purpose or like a deep down purpose that like gets me excited is when I feel uniquely useful. So there have definitely been times in my life where I think it doesn't even matter what I do. Could, I, I mean, there, there's, you know, hundred thousand different things that I could do. I will be satisfied if I am uniquely useful. And I think if people can find that in their lives, that's valuable because that gives you purpose. Being useful is important, but, but if you can be replicated by someone else or by a bot or whatever, you're not going to feel a lot of purpose. But if there are particular skills or attributes that you have that you can apply to be useful, that's when you really feel like, okay, I am needed here. I have a purpose here. Um, So that, that is deep down what I want to achieve. And in terms of a legacy, you know, I'd love for, for people to watch my videos and feel, you know, inspired and feel like they've gained knowledge and uh, a new appreciation of the universe. Maybe most of all, I want people to come away with an understanding of how to get at what's true. Because deep down, I mean, that's what my channel is about. That's what I'm about, is about figuring out the truth. And that's something that we all grapple with every day, like what actually is true. And I am not of the belief that truth is sort of a relative construct and that there's mm -hmm. different truths for different people. Like, I think there is an objective reality. It is knowable and we can figure it out if we just try hard enough and use the right strategies. So I want people to also have that um, perspective on the world and, and hopefully apply those strategies in their own lives to, uh, to get at the truth. There's a foundational principle on which everything is based for me, which is that 
when you know things that are true, you will live a better, happier, more fulfilled life. That is something that I could sort of take as axiomatically true, that, that uh, knowing the truth and acting on that is a million times better than uh, acting on things that are, that are maybe not true. Uh, how did you get to your life philosophy of that there is objective uh, reality, it is knowable, you need to know the truth and you'll, be, you'll live a happier life? Was it family, school, friends? I have no idea where that comes from. I have no idea where that comes from. To me, it just feels like common sense. It feels like core to my being. And I'm not sure if it came from my family or my school or it, it just I was born with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, how people can help their inner scientists, uh, their inner curious being to uh, rise higher and be stronger and so on? Hmm. How can people help their inner scientist rise up? Yeah. I think most people are born as sort of innate scientists. I see it in my children that they always want to perform experiments even though they wouldn't describe them as such. They're always doing things and observing the results and figuring out the way the world works in that way. So I guess I would encourage people to do more experiments. And I don't just mean physics experiments or science experiments. I mean, try changing the things that you do. Because I think we get stuck in these ruts. I spoke about this in my Bayesian trap video, which is that we start to imagine the world as maybe more consistent than it is. And one of the reasons why it's so consistent is because our input to the world is the same every time. It's hard to think outside the box, think laterally or think about different things you might try. But if you can start to think of some uh, different things you can experiment with, you can achieve different outcomes and you can see the way the world works in a better way. If you're only ever providing one input, if you're never doing experiments or trying different things, then you'll never uh, sort of push beyond those, those sort of limitations that you currently see. But then you have a high risk of making mistakes and even fail. How yeah. do you deal with that? I mean, you Th probably that don't is life. That is life, figuring out how to deal with failure. I mean, I think, I think one of the biggest things that predicts someone's success is their ability to take failures and then keep going. Um, I made this video about, you know, would you take this bet, which yeah. is a, a great metaphor for your life. You're going to go through life and you're going to have these opportunities to take little bets. And you are going to risk something every time. Risk is a part of life. And what that video kind of shows is that we are naturally uncomfortable with risk and that a loss of a certain amount hurts more than a gain of that same amount, right? That is how our brains are wired. They are wired to avoid loss. That's loss aversion. But if we can acknowledge that that's the way our brains work and say, no, I will, I will take the risk because I know ultimately this will work out in my favor. Like if I can assess the odds fairly and I can see that like if you repeated this a hundred times, I have to come out ahead, then you should take it every time. So we need to take a more expansive view of our lives and realize that, you know, there are going to be ups and downs, uh, but you need to keep taking risks in order to push forward. It's essential. So basically, as Elon Musk, Musk did, crushing like eight or s several falcons before launching one successfully, that's the right strategy in life. In your Absolutely. Opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think everyone who's successful has many stories of failure before they get there. I mean, that's, that's the norm. So if you have a few failures and you quit, that's real failure. Real failure is like refusing to, to try again. Hmm. And speaking of, uh, do you watch what's going on with, uh, yeah, like, for example, with Elon Musk and other private space companies and other innovators? Do you follow yeah. them? Who is your favorite? Uh, it's tough to say. I mean, uh, Elon Musk is definitely up there in terms of people who I feel like have transformed industries. You know, he really has brought electric cars to the fore when I think a lot of other big car companies could have done that, but they didn't. They didn't take the risk. They didn't experiment. And this is, again, where I'm saying, like, find ways to experiment that aren't too costly. You know, 
if I try a different video format or whatever, if it flops, it doesn't matter. It's one video. I'll move on and people will get over it. We can always experiment and, and, and fix things up. So, you know, the big car companies could have experimented, but this is the this is the problem of incumbency. Once you become big and sort of a stagnant organization, it's tough to maintain that idea of like, okay, we're just going to make lots more little experiments and see if we can get anywhere. Um, so he came in and experimented big with, okay, I'm going to make electric cars, and no one thinks a new car company is possible in these days. But here he is making a go of it. Okay, there's challenges, but... It's still going. Um, SpaceX, you know, coming in and saying, "I'm going to make reusable rockets. I'm going to lower the factor, lower the price by a factor of, I don't know, three, five, ten, um, and we're going to make space accessible that way." Um, these ideas are great ideas, and you need people who are kind of crazy enough to pursue them. So, yeah, I, I uh, have the utmost respect for people like Elon Musk and other entrepreneurs who are really pushing the boundaries and experimenting every day, and even in the face of failure, getting up and going again. You know, that's what you need. Uh, that's inspiring. <laughs> I think it is inspiring. And, and like, I myself need this inspiration often because, like, making things is an audacious act because, you know, most things end in failure. Like, mm. success is, is rare. And so every time you're mounting all this energy and you're pushing it towards something, it's like you are doing this thing that is just going to collapse. And it, and it takes a lot of personal strength to be able to say, no, I'm still going to do it, and I'm going to try to raise it up to a place where it will be successful. Um, you know, that it's an audacious act of, of, of hope and, like, hope for the future that, that you can achieve something. Uh, do you have a role model or somebody who ex inspires you? I am inspired by a number of people. I'm inspired by other science communicators. You know, I'm inspired wow. by, by Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye and Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. the people who came before. Um, I'm inspired by some other YouTube channels and the work that I see being done. I'm inspired by great art. You know, sometimes I go to an art museum like the one in, in New York and I see these like huge Monet paintings of uh, lily pads. And again, it's that same thing when I look at it and I see you had to be bold to do this. You had to risk failure to do this, but he did and he took big risks and he, he, he made it happen. So I see this sort of inspiration in, in all aspects of my life. I'm inspired by, by films, you know, deep down. Um, there are some great films that I think have inspired me, like Lost in Translation or Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind or Shawshank Redemption, which I put near the top, or uh, most of Paul Thomas Anderson's uh, movies, Magnolia, you know. These are films that are big and take on important themes, and they do and they do it so beautifully and so um, emotionally effectively. So yeah, I, I'm inspired by film, and you know maybe if I wasn't doing science films, I would try to do film films, or maybe I'll try to do the crossover at some point, or maybe I'll try to make a big documentary that is all crafted from my own hand at some point, you know. I do want to take big risks. I do want to make big things that I'm proud of. So, so um, those are things that, that may happen in my future. But among the movies you just named, the only science fiction kind was uh, the Eternal Sunshine of Spotless Mind. Yeah, yeah but I, I don't, I don't, you know, have a hard and fast rule. I also loved Gravity. I mean, if we're focusing on particular categories, but but uh, but I love like you know human stories. Um, Yeah. And you also mentioned that you love some of other uh, science channels. Uh, can you give some examples? Who do you watch? Yeah. Well, I watch all of my friends. So, you know, the Vsauce channels, Minute Physics, Smarter Every Day. You know, I love the work By Heart does. Yeah. Uh, she's not doing as much these days. Uh, who else? Uh, Physics Girl, who mm -hmm. sort of I've helped mentor and... and um, And I love to see the, the way that she does her work, too. Um, there, there's, there's so many. 
And what about books? Uh, what can you recommend? Maybe three three books, for example, to read. So my number one might be uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Mm -hmm. Such an excellent book. I've taken a lot of ideas for videos from that book. Um, and it really, it, it summarized a lot of what I learned in my PhD. Um, let's take a fiction book, uh, Everything is Illuminated by Jonathan Safran Foer. I mm -hmm. love this book, um, deep down. There's so many books to pick from, it's very hard. I loved The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. Um, it was a great book, and really... You know, it was weird to come out of a biology education and then be totally surprised by this book. So, yeah, maybe that's that's three books in sort of different areas. Okay, thanks. And uh, also, we have just some short questions from the subscribers. Uh, Very good. So, what grades did you have in school? The best grades. Yes. I graduated top of my class. There were 425 students. My graduating average was roughly 98%. Oh. Um, yeah, so, so I was the best student in my class, basically from uh, as early as I can remember. I won the, the top award graduating elementary school in grade six, um, and top awards for you know physics and chemistry and math and French and you know you name it. So you've been a nerd all your life. More or less, but I liked to conceptualize myself as the cool nerd, you know. <laughs> Once I got to college, uh, I think I was less focused on academics. Once I was at college, I was ranked 12th out of 600 engineers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something. Uh, what are your hobbies? My hobbies? These days I like uh, biking. Mm -hmm. So I've got a hill where I live on and I bike up to the top of the hill and there's a trail. Um, and I love biking that trail. I do it as much as I can. I like swimming when I when the weather's nice and running. And now that I have kids, like I don't know if that counts as a hobby, but they take up a lot of time. So and I, and I do love them so much. So you know, I, I love playing with them and and uh, seeing them grow. Uh, do you play guitar? Do you still I do play, play guitar? I do play guitar and I sing, but you know, I've been doing a lot less of that recently. Like even the last five years, I haven't done it very much. So I should do more of that. Weird one. Do you believe in God? No. Maybe maybe the clearer way to ask it is, do you believe in the supernatural? And the answer is no. no. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think that the universe is made of stuff and dark matter, dark energy or whatever, but that it interacts according to the laws of physics. And um, I don't see, I mean, you could call the entire universe God if you wanted to, but... That seems unnecessary to me. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I think every every fair atheist has to be an agnostic, like fundamentally, because the, 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 the question is unknowable. But to say that the answer is unknowable is not to say that the probabilities are equal. So that's mm -hmm. the fallacy if you're like, well, you know, I can't say for sure there's no God, but there's probably no God. Uh, <laughs> like that, 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 I think that's fair. Would you go to Mars? If I had no kids, the answer is an easy yes. Now that I've got kids, well, we'd have to see what stage of life we're at and they're at, you know. <laughs> if, I, if I didn't feel like I was abandoning my family, then maybe yes. And the last one is probably what, uh, what tips could you give to someone who wants to take uh, your path, the same path as you did? Yeah. So... I love my path. Taking this path has been the best decision in my life. But I would say that because it's worked out for me. If it didn't work out for me, maybe I would be very jaded and upset about you know spending all this time making videos no one watched. Um, so think one of the, one of the things you have to know going in is that probability of success is low. But if that's really what you want to do, then you have to do it. And uh, as long as you you know you can accept that risk of failure, and the key is not stopping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I worked for 
on my YouTube channel full time for two years before it was making enough money to pay for my rent and my food. So, you know, I had to find another job and I was working as a, as a teacher um, about 15 hours a week to sort of pay the bills and then like 40, 50 hours a week on YouTube videos. So, um, yeah, for me, it only took two years, but for some people, it takes much longer than that. I think recently, you know, Mr. Beast has blown up and he was on YouTube for like six, seven years before anything really started to happen with his channel. So I think this idea of, you know, continuing to try in the face of adversity is the surest path to success. So, you know, people have to be ready for a battle because it is. And I think every, everything in life uh, worth doing is, is kind of a battle. So I don't know. I, I hope that's, that's useful advice. Um, I think mix that with the idea of experimentation, yeah. doing little experiments and seeing what the response is, you know, that helps you figure out what you're doing that's working and what you're doing that's not working. Yeah, so we have 200,000 subscribers and our friends, they have 600,000 subscribers. They're doing their own scientific videos. Uh, so what would you say and, uh, to Russian audience that loves your videos? Maybe you have something to wish or to say? Well, uh, for one thing, I mean, thank you for watching my videos. Like, it is so exciting that anyone finds these things useful. Like, fundamentally, I make the videos because I love doing it. And the fact that other people watch them and enjoy them is like the biggest bonus for me. So, you know, thank you for watching them and, and thank you for translating them into Russian. Um, you know, it, it's great to be able to live at a time when we can do this because I know just 20 years ago when I graduated from high school, um, this was not possible. You know, communicating with people across the world, sharing scientific ideas, and making videos that people can watch, not a possibility. And now this is my life. And so I am so incredibly thankful for everyone who's made it possible, including you and including the entire, you know, Russian audience. And thank you very much for making these videos because they really change the way people think, I believe. So, yeah. Thank I hope you. so. I hope so. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.